This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. You know, an interesting thing happened uh, after we had done our last filming right before Tabernacles. I went to the computer, grabbed the card, stuck it in there, and it said empty. This has a backup card, pulled it out, stuck it in there, and it said empty. And I thought, oh, great, we lost the message. Put the cards back in the camera this morning, and it says, hey, what do you want to do with this video? And so I was able to rescue it this morning, so next week I've got two videos that I've got to edit. Uh, but one of the things I want to share is understanding God's throne and having faith in His throne. You know, we, we, in America, we have a collective consciousness of unrighteous thrones because of England. That in the time of the revolution, the corruption in England had gotten so bad, and there was also the revivals of Whitfield and, and many others here in America, that the, the discussion was, they are so corrupt, we can no longer allow ourselves as a people to be ruled by them. And so we separated ourselves to create a democratic republic. We are not a democracy. Democracy, mob rules, we're a republic. We're governed by laws. And they're supposed to be righteous laws, but uh, as we're learning on the, you know, there's over two million laws on the books, and so you can get up and stand up and stretch in the morning, you've just violated at least two laws in America if they'd ever want to press, the, press that. We also see in America that we have unrighteous judges, we have unrighteous politicians, that we have just all kinds of crazy stuff going on where many times in courts, you're not guaranteed to get justice. In fact, people would be surprised to find out the court system in America also has a Dun and Bradstreet number, which means it's for profit. And so we see all these things going on, and there seems to be, and I've seen this historically, I've been in ministry most of my life, except the time I served in the military and I was still kind of in ministry. But whenever you would talk about the judgment of God and us needing God's judgment, it wasn't the sinners that freaked out, it was the Christians. That somehow or another there has been transference that we have taken our mistrust of a throne, and we've translated it over to the kingdom of God. And uh, guys, we need to have a, a paradigm shift in that we, number one, need to surrender to God's throne for, for service. How many know we're not here to serve denominations? We're not here to serve organizations. We're here to serve Him and Him alone. We have a king and we serve Him. But at the same time, we've got to trust God's throne with both mercy and judgment. And that's, that's something the body has yet to learn. And I think because of that, we have resisted as a whole calling out for God to judge anything. Afraid that the fire is going to land on us, you know. And, you know, if, if we feel like that, my first thing to say is, okay, what secret sin, what favorite sin are you worried about that you have not went to the throne and confessed and got under the blood? But 
in my, in my last book, The Kingdom Priesthood, one of the things I end the book with is as you're working through the outer court into the inner court and you finally get into the, your internal holy of holies where the, the Ark of the Covenant was the throne of God on the earth. And we, that, we have that internally. The, the entire tabernacle is built within. In fact, what's amazing, if you go to the book of Revelation, this shows you how disaccurate God is. You have the four and twenty elders... You have the throne of God, and, and you know, we, we know about rainbows on earth, but why is God's rainbow green over his throne? It's like, couldn't he afford any other colors? Or even the sea of glass, when you put it together, it's the human torso. That our bodies were modeled after the very throne of God. And so you have your gallbladder and you have your liver, it's all green. And so when he made us, he made us because he wanted to inhabit and to rule from here, from the get-go. Okay? And when we get to that Holy of Holies, there's an absolute surrender. And at that surrender, you are both commissioned, you fully surrender. The fire of God fully is, is working the way it should in your life. When you're really functioning with God the way that you need to, the fire of God functions in the outer court, the inner court, and in the Holy of Holies. When that happens, you're commissioned to be a warrior. Only a priest that has went through their stuff, that has completely surrendered, is going to be a faithful warrior. That's why I don't use warrior priest. God really got on my case about that because that's actually the direction I wanted to go. And he said, no, it's a priestly warrior. That only when you surrender before that throne can you not end up being something called a ronin. Now that's actually an oriental expression for a warrior without a master. And so they're, they're like a mercenary. I don't want to be a mercenary in the kingdom. And I think we have a lot of people that are doing what they call spiritual warfare and they're mercenaries because it's about self-interest instead of the king's interest. And that's why this is so important. And, and recently God has been having me read through the book of Psalms and I mean just taking it apart. I love the book of Psalms. It is our spiritual warfare manual. The early church... The book of Psalms was not only their, their hymnal, it, it was their, their spiritual warfare manual. You read through it, and God, we need justice, we need judgment, we need mercy. I mean, David was plain. He said, listen, my enemies, Lord, knocked their teeth out. I mean, I, that's one of the reasons why David was a man after God's own heart. He just simply shared his heart, and he expressed it. And so I'm, I'm reading through the Psalms, and David is actually a, a powerful Old Testament example of a priestly warrior, and that where did he start? He did not start out in training school to become a warrior. He was a shepherd worshiping God in the hills around Jerusalem and in Bethlehem. He was a worshiper first, and the worshiper who had learned the commandments of God, had learned what it meant to be in covenant, he's the one who became a warrior and then became a king. And so as we examine him, we, we really begin to understand our calling in God. Now, when David was confronted with Goliath, how many remember the story? Everybody's hiding in their foxholes. And so... Jesse sends David up, go, get, go bring your brother some food. He gets up there and it's like he forgets about the food. He say, what on earth is going on? Why are you letting this one big tall fat guy defy the armies of the living God? And I'm going to read this out of, out of uh, 1 Samuel 17 and 26. And so everybody's hiding and everything, and the king says, you know, the, there's a reward for whoever gets this Philistine. And picking up here in verse 26, then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Look at the next statement. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He's someone without covenant that he should defy the armies of the living God. You see, what David was concerned with was God's reputation and that he had defied the armies of God, not the armies of Israel, not my brothers. I wasn't worried about my family reputation. What are we going to say if, if Bubba never gets out of the foxhole and fights? We're just going to be a laughingstock in all of Israel. That was not his concern. His concern 
was the reputation of God. And he knew Genesis 6. He knew that this thing was part Nephilim and that it was defying the armies of the living God. Can you see the difference in the attitude? Because he had, he had surrendered in the back hills, worshiping God in that process. He had surrendered to God. That's why when Samuel came up and looked at all his brothers, and all his brothers were taller, he looked at all the brothers. Oh, he's not here, but God told me it was in the house of Jesse. If you got another one, well, we got this runt out here. The youngest one. He's not much to look at. And they forget that whole time when he was a shepherd, an overseer, that he killed a lion and he killed a bear with nothing but a slingshot. I wouldn't recommend you trying that. I prefer a 44 Magnum, something a little bit bigger, bazooka. (laughs) But he had developed skills because he loved the sheep. He had a shepherd's heart. He got that from worshiping God. And because of that, it set him in the proper place. Now a true kingdom priestly warrior is not in service to anybody but Jesus. Now when Jesus and an organization are working in the same vein, that's great. But one of the things I have seen over history, when I I, I love studying uh, Christian history. I love studying revivals. And revivals can start out good. How many know they can turn south real easily? And what happens is they lose sight of God, and it's about keeping this thing going, keeping the organization going. We must protect the organization. Let me tell you something. When the organization is worried about protecting the reputation of God, God will protect the organization, not vice versa. And I mean, it has literally caused God to lift his hands off of organizations. That they they end up, I mean, John Wesley... His greatest fear was that his movement would have become a dead, dried-up church just like all the organizations in his day. That was his greatest fear. I think he's up in heaven saying, Father, is there anything that you can do to pour out revival once again? I want to go to Psalms chapter 9, and I want to show you some powerful things. You know, even when you, when you understand and begin learning a little bit of Hebrew, And you're reading in Genesis when God is creating the heavens and the earth. He's only referred to as Elohim. Now, Elohim represents the justice of God, God the judge. He's creator, so all things must give an account to him. Because he's creator. That's one of the reasons why Richard Dawson and all those absolutely hate the concept of God being creator. They don't want to be answerable to anybody. And... uh, But the moment he makes man, he reveals himself with something even the serpent in the garden didn't know. Because the the Nehesh in the garden, that seraphim that came down, called him only Elohim. But the Bible says he became Yahweh Elohim. He, He introduced a new aspect of himself. Yahweh represents the mercy of God. Elohim represents the justice of God. And so God enacted his entire throne to balance grace and judgment together. In fact, it's, it's a, it is a prophetic word of the, the, the both comings of Jesus. Yahweh is Messiah ben Joseph, the suffering servant that came to bring grace. That's why Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Any time in the Old Testament except for one place that you see God. It is Jesus. It is a theophanies. The only time you see the Father is in the book of Daniel, where the Ancient of Days, that's the Father, and the Son of Man, which is Messiah, Jesus, is standing before him. The rabbis know this. I believe it was Ruskin who said in one of his books, in fact, he wrote a book about Jesus being the Messiah. I'm pretty sure it was Ruskin. And he said when... He said, we know, we, we rabbis know, we Jews know that Messiah, the Son of Man, was the only knowable aspect of God. So Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus was the only way to the Father. Out of the way, he's the one who gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. He's the one who spoke the law to Moses. He's the one who took down Pharaoh. He's the one who created Adam. All of that is what many theologians would call a Christophanes, 
a pre-incarnate Christ, and they try to divide those from the Theophanies, and they haven't gotten the, the memo yet that almost all of those were Jesus, okay? And so the very moment that God made man, he had to balance mercy and justice together for our sakes. And so with that in mind, I want to look here at Psalms chapter 9. It says, For you have maintained my right and my cause. You sat on the throne judging in righteousness. In verse 4, underline that God always judges in righteousness. He doesn't get so upset that it's not done in righteousness. Do you know what that means? I'm ex-military. That means he can rain down fire on the enemy and not hit me as a target. In God's kingdom, there's no such thing as friendly fire, of getting hit by friendly fire. That I can walk through God's landmines, and if I'm following the leading of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to make it over to the other side because I trust his grace and his judgment. Okay? Okay. It says, you have rebuked the nations, you have destroyed the wicked, you have blotted out their names forever and ever. O enemy, destructions are finished forever, and you have destroyed cities. Even their memory has perished. But the Lord shall endure forever, for he has prepared his throne for judgment. That is a very biblical concept. One of the things that the feasts teach us, and I'm going to be able to now post in the video I thought I lost, I get to resurrect, is the, po the, the feast teach us not only these cycles of sanctification, but that we need divine intervention in the life of humanity. That if humanity is allowed to run its course, it will absolutely destroy itself. We're kind of seeing that today because all the world leaders are drunk on the, on the wine of the whore of Babylon today. They're listening to principalities and powers. If you think Washington, D.C. is what controls America, you're wrong. What's the CCP? Well, they're given their portion, and I think a lot of what we have in D.C. is compromised by the Communist Chinese Party. But they're answerable to somebody, too. That there are meetings like Devos, and I'm officially calling Devos the Revenge of the Nerds. Because all the nerds got together and they're trying to act revenge by controlling the world. They're, they're literally a group of Sheldons off of uh, Big Bang Theory or something, you know. They want to control the world so that the jocks and everything will never punish them again. They never want a wedgie again. So they're going to control the planet. But see, Devos or the Bilderbergs or the many round, uh, the round tables that were established by Cecil Rhodes, we have the Council on Formulations, all those are answerable to another group. And when this group meets, principalities and powers show up to give instruction. And so when that is going on, we need God to prepare his throne for judgment. He prepares his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. There that is twice again. Why is the reputation with the repetition here? God's righteous in what he does. When we read in the book of Revelation, as God pours out his wrath on the earth, those in heaven are saying, everything that you do is righteous, just, and true. Because they see it from God's point of view. We need to underline that when God begins to move, it is always done righteously. And he shall administer judgment for the people in uprightness. Now we're shifting here. You have bad players, you have good players. When God begins to move in judgment, it's to free the good players from the bad players. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something with you that may warp your theology just a little bit, but grace and judgment are two sides of the same coin. They are twin forces. The day that you got saved, God judged the kingdom of darkness in your behalf. 
If you have ever had God answer a prayer, he extended grace to you while he judged the thing that you were praying about. Anytime that you have had healing where God has healed your body, he gave you grace and he judged that sickness. We need to have our, our idea of the judgment of God. If I'm right with God, he judges in my behalf, never against me. So he's administering judgment for the people in uprightness. Look at the next word, next verse. And the Lord shall be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those that seek you. He's executing judgment while setting people free. And I think one of the reasons we, we have lost sight of this in the body of Christ, we may have it in our systematic theologies, but in our practical theologies, in our practice, we have lost this concept. And so no one is crying out for God to judge. Now this word uprightness I love where it says God, he, he judges the people in uprightness. It's meshar in, in Hebrew which means evenness, uprightness, straightness, equity, level. You know what that means? In heaven, there's no backroom deals. There's no political favors called in. Where I know the plaintiff should win this, but because there's going to be political things done for the judge, he rules in the other favor. When a judge goes, and you know, there's, there's a reason in America we have Lady, uh, lady Justice with her, with her blindfold on, because she's only supposed to weigh the evidence. But we forgot to check her pocket. She could feel how much one pocket was getting filled up with goods. And that began to tip the scales of justice in America. In God's judgment, there is no political favoritism. There's no backroom deals. No one can tip the scales in, in the other's favor by giving God a bribe. Why could you give God to bribe him? He owns everything. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the gold, oil, and taters underneath. He owns the universe. What could you give to bribe God? Nothing. You know, Lucifer tried it. When Jesus started his ministry, he said, bow down and worship me and I'll give you the nations. You're not going to have to go the hard way. That was a bribe, Jack. Let me give you the easy way. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. If he did it with the cross in view, what could bribe our judge? Let's go and look at verse 16 here of, of chapter 9. Do you know one of the reasons why God is not known in the earth today as he should be? The body has been asking him to hold off judgment. Just hold it off until my, my Willy Wonka golden ticket is due. Because you only know homie can go through this so much. And I've been promised an easy thing until all the prophecy starts hitting the fan. But Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Okay? God, for the Lord is known by the judgment which he executes... And the wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. So when we cry out for judgment, it's the wicked that are caught in the nets that they're setting for the innocent. Do you guys see that? Boy, that's not being preached, is it? When was the last time that we heard a message on a need to call out for the judgment of God? In fact, recently, I just, I just saw one this week I'm going to have a chance to listen to. I, there was a conservative commentator comment on this preacher, and this preacher says, if your congregation is bereaved 
of warriors, you're a cursed congregation. And I thought, I want to listen to that message. Now we've already determined that from God's throne that grace and mercy must flow for it to be the throne of God. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2. Now this Isaiah chapter 2 is talking about the millennial reign. And I have a problem. We have some ministries saying, you know, when Jesus comes back, that's it, it's over. There's not going to be a millennial reign. That's just a figment of the Apostle John's imagination that even though he outlaid it in the book of Revelation, it's not really going to happen. But what they forget is that there are more prophetic references in the Old Testament to the, uh, to the millennial reign of Christ than there are his first coming. So we got a whole lot of scripture yet to be fulfilled. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 2, then the word uh, that Isaiah the son of Amos uh, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, now it shall come to pass in the latter days. How many know that we're approaching the end of the latter days? like a rocket that somebody has lit. That the mountain of the Lord shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Now that's talking about even not only the mountains, the three mountains that Israel or Jerusalem is set on. And I mean, know wherever God is, that one's Zion. It used to be wherever the Ark of the Covenant was, that was Zion. Jeremiah tells us the Ark of the Covenant is in heaven. We'll, we'll not see it again. So everybody say, well, the Ark of Covenant is here, the Ark of Covenant is there. We've already dealt with that in Scripture. It's the throne of God, the throne of God. That was a holding place for Jesus when he gets to sit on his throne. Okay, so here he is sitting on the throne, and he's exalted above all the other mountains which represent political, military power. And the people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge between the nations, and rebuke many people, and he, they will beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks, and nations shall not lift up sword against nations, neither shall they learn war anymore. I'm looking forward to that as well as decommissioning all the nuclear weapons and all the other things they have back there in bunkers that we don't even know about. But it said from, the, from, from his throne, from where his throne was, that the Torah will flow. Now, I want to deal just quickly about a couple of things. When you, when you look at Torah in Hebrew, it paints a picture. And it's not of a king giving edicts that if you don't do, that you're dead. It's of a father teaching his young son how to shoot an arrow. And so you have the target there, and he shoots it. And uh, when you're first learning how to shoot, you don't understand the rise and the power of gravity. So it falls short of the target. And the Torah of God is the father coming and saying, Junior, lift it up a little higher this time. That's the concept of what Torah means or the law of God. Now, unfortunately, when they had done the Septuagint and we have our Greek New Testament, the Greeks did not have a word for that. And so what the rabbis did is borrow a word that they used for the orbit of a planet around the sun. And this is the course that must be followed, knowing that if it would fall out of that course, that catastrophe could happen. But we're not done. Then we have something called the Vulgate Bible, which was in Latin. Well, in Latin, they didn't have any equivalent for Torah, and they chose Lex. Law. So, out of Jerusalem is going to flow the loving instruction of the Father. And because of that, I think we misconstrue a lot of the arguments of the Apostle Paul. He was dealing with regulations of men and not of God with most of his stuff. Because wouldn't it sound absolutely idiotic to say, I am not under the loving instruction of the Father. But law, that's very Romanish. 
Because Rome did no loving instruction of the Father. Many times, even as a young Roman, you were taught by the, the strap across your back to make you tough, to make you a soldier. They didn't understand a dad coming and putting his shoulder on his son lovingly and say, just a little bit higher, aim it just a little bit better, you're going to hit it this time. So not only do we have to have grace and judgment flow from the throne, but we've got to have the instruction of the king flowing from the throne, which are called decrees. The mitzvot, the judgments of God. And when we have all three, then and only then is God's throne established in our lives. We have rejected his instruction. We like the grace part. And so we leave, we leave God with one third of a throne in our lives to function from. We have handicapped ourselves. And we need to allow God to be God and for him to establish his throne in our lives, in our communities, by accepting his instruction, expecting his grace, and pleading for his judgment when things get bad. Am I making sense this morning? Okay. Now, because of David's faith in the God's throne, and David, back then they understood thrones. I think we have been so far removed from thrones, as well as any idea of what a righteous throne looks like, that we're not connecting to God, but David did. In Psalms 9, 19, and 20, he utters something that is reminiscent of, of Moses. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail, let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. This whole concept, arise, O Lord, arise, O Lord. In fact, the first time we see that mentioned is by Moses. Any time that they would break camp, and the Ark of the Covenant would be bore up on the shoulders of the, of the priests, Moses would say this, and this is in Numbers 10.35. And so when it was when the Ark set out, that Moses said, Arise, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered, and let those that hate you fear flee before you. So God, we're exalting your throne, we're asking you to arise so that your enemies would flee before you. You see, a priestly warrior is more concerned about the enemies of God than he is his own enemies. And that's a critical point that we need to understand. Over and over again in the Psalms, he would say, you're doing this and you're rising up in strength because of your enemies. How many know the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness that fell at the Tower of Babel would love to expunge the knowledge of who Jesus is and who Yahweh Elohim is in the earth. They would like to destroy both the Christian and the Jew. In fact, that's the very, fun, that's the very foundation of nihilism that goes back to the beginnings of communism and Marxism. It goes back to the writings of, of Jacob Frank, who was one of the founding members of the Illuminati. He hated Moses... He thought he could, get, he could gain redemption through iniquity rather than through righteousness. And he was a nihilist. Burn it down. And so God has enemies. There are enemies in the earth today. Many of the political things are enemies of God. Our nation in many ways and our leadership has, be, has set themselves up as enemies of God. How many know the CCP is enemies of God? Not China. What is it, 1.6 billion people in China are being ruled by less than 1 million communists and have become enslaved to them. They need to be set free. And Christianity is growing in leaps and bounds in China. We need to pray for God to judge a political thing just like he needs to hear so that the people can be free. Then we see... David's song, and this one, I'm, 
uh, many congregations have sung, and we hear Paul Wilbur singing it in Psalms 68, 1 through 3. Let God arise, let the enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him as smoke is driven away. So drive them away as wax melts before the fire. So let the wicked perish at the presence of, the, of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. So when God arises, the enemy is dispelled and God's people rejoice. I need to drive that home. Even Solomon said the same thing. Let's go to Second, uh, Second Chronicles, chapter six, starting with verse forty-one. It says, "Now therefore arise, O Lord God, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength." Let your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and let your saints rejoice in goodness. O Lord God, do not turn away your face of, uh, the face of your anointed, and remember the mercies of your servant David. And so here he's calling for God to arise. Are you catching on to the theme that I'm heading with today? There's a transition. I, I encourage you to read the book of Psalms because I could give you occasion after occasion after occasion. David is first praying, God, take care of your enemies. Rise, expunge your enemies. And then there's a transition in the writings of David. And David says, because, you have, because I am concerned with you rising and taking care of your enemies, now arise and take care of mine too. It's this covenant relationship when I make God's enemies my enemies. When I realize that our culture is controlled by principalities and powers and rulers of darkness that hate God, I stop looking for relevance with a culture that's going to hell and I start seeking for God to raise up to judge those principalities so that those that are caught in darkness can come out. But the church right now is enamored with finding their cultural relevance. Our cultural relevance is we are of another kingdom and we ain't nothing like you. We're what it looks like to walk in righteousness. We're what it looks like to be redeemed and walking to another Torah. Have you ever caught when, when the Apostle Paul in, in the book of Romans he was saying, you know, I learned the Torah as a child. Something revived in me. And then there was another Torah that took over. The Torah of sin and death. Hell has its own Torah. And God has his. They follow the Torah of hell. Which has been expressed in many different ways. Ali Esther Crowley, do as thou wilt is the whole of the law. You see it through uh, uh, Sabbatai Zev and through uh, Jacob Frank is, Blessed art thou, Lord, O God, who has made the forbidden permissible. Sounds to me like they've been listening to hyper grace teaching right now in the church. When I make sin in my life an enemy, and I resist it, when I start praying that God would send warring spirits to judge the principalities and powers over in an area so that people can get set free. I am making God's enemy my enemy, and I refuse to be influenced in any way by the mystery religions. I am setting myself up in a covenant relationship. God says, you make my enemies your enemies. I'm going to make your enemies mine. And I'm not talking about Susie, who you're in a quarrel with down the street. I'm talking about your real enemies because, in essence, they're expressions of his enemies. It is time for the body of Christ in our daily prayers to begin crying out, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. We need to pray it over our cities. We need to pray it over our nations. We need to pray it globally. Because I still believe that we're going to have one great last revival. Did you know right now there are more people 
alive on planet Earth that has existed from Adam to about 1960? There are more people alive today that can get saved. You want to talk about the Lamb receiving the reward of His suffering. We're more concerned with getting out of here than getting the band together so that we can go. Come on now. And to do that, God has got to judge so they can be free, so that the spell is broken, so that the technosomptuary is broken, so they can... Have you, have, you, have you seen the kids? Have you seen those in, in the political left that are just, they're, they're with this glazed over? And they're not actually taking anything that I know about. They're just glazed over. And they're, they're woke. I prefer to be the awakened. I have awakened to righteousness. Why do I worry about them so? Because one of the men that helped add a lot of the fuel to the fire was a guy named Sololinsky, who basically had the same ideas, Stalin and Lenin and all those. All these kids and all these adults that are just, they're chanting all this stuff and they think they're really doing something that they're not. Their very leaders called them useful idiots. Cannon fodder. I'd rather see them set free and find the freedom that we have in Christ. And be at peace. That's so a cry for God to raise up in judgment is also a cry for revival. He's got to judge the practitioners who have contaminated the pool. Our seminaries were invaded by Marxists in 1930. And they have been tweaking our theology and tweaking our theology and tweaking our theology where it doesn't even look the same anymore. Anytime I want to get really some in-depth commentary, I go to the 18th or 19th century. Because once we get to the 20th century, we solely got stuck on stupid after the Marxists came in and began doing things. We've got to return to a pure faith. We've got to have that priestly warrior heart that it's about saving souls and getting them trained up so that they can become priestly warriors too. Because one of the things I disagree with with uh, my Baptist brethren in my, in my upbringing, they used to say, when that last soul is saved, we're getting out of here. When that last believer is matured and we have the restoration of all things, then we get out of here. The harpazo of the church is not to get us out of here before it gets too bad for us because you know only homie can take so much. It's that we have become like, oh, what was the, the, the it was, had Bruce Willis in it and they were in Africa and they were Navy SEALs. And they're almost getting shot to pieces before, the, before they got air support. And they were, they were crying out, hold the line. They made a positional line, they fired on the enemy, and they refused to move because there were civilians that they were trying to save. God is calling the remnant to hold the line. And that there's an anointing coming in the last days that the remnant will be able to hold the line even against the son of perdition. And all the craziness that the world is doing. That we will hold the line. That we will be faithful. And at that moment God says, listen, my wife has made herself ready. She has matured as much as she can mature. There's not another thing that she can learn. There's not another victory that she can win. Come up here so we can have a marriage feast. And then we're going to go down together and we're going to take care of business. That's my eschatology. And if you've got a problem with it, talk to God, because that's the way I see it. When you put the feast and you understand all these things together, it's there. Even where we get this secret capturing away, you know, in, in, in uh, I think it's 1 uh, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, it's created by an artificial chapter that was not there. I don't know the Apostle Paul didn't say, chapter 4, verse 1. 
That's all one discussion. And so the Harpazo is connected with the day of the Lord and the day of the Lord is the Valley of Armageddon. It's all connected. There's no secret. He's coming back once. Jesus didn't stutter. He didn't say, I'm coming back and again and again and maybe again even after that. I've actually had some try to merge them all together and says there's three, there's three raptures in the, in, in, the, in the tribulation period. There's one. I think we get out of here 10 days early. I think the, all the wrath, the, the wrath of God, we have been delivered from the wrath to come, is going to be poured out in 10 days. Oh, but all the, all the professors say it's going to be three and a half years. But understand this, that Jesus fulfilled the spring feast in seven days. He was the Passover lamb. He was the oven loved bread. And he was the first fruits offering in seven days. So I think I can take care of the other in ten, don't you? So it's a call for us to mature. Begin reading through the Psalms and see how much God, how much the psalmists talk about the judgment of God. And a call for God's judgment as a necessity for the righteous. If we'll begin doing that, our paradigm will shift and our prayers will shift to what they need to be in this time and in this place. In fact, I believe there is a demonic spirit or spirits even behind COVID-19. There was some type of weird alchemy techno-sorcery thing that has gone on with it. And if that is the case, then there can be spiritual warfare done against it. And even if there isn't, there has been spiritual warfare historically done in the past that have driven off plagues. So it's in our hands. God is saying, are we going to mature enough that we can trust the throne? That we, when we call for air support, that's what judgment is, that we know that God is not going to drop the bombs on our heads. He's going to drop them on the enemies while extending grace to those walking with him. And righteousness hebraically means salvation. Those that are walking in their salvation will rejoice at his judgment. Well, Father, this morning I ask that you would change our paradigm, Father. Change our prayer life. Father, let it begin to flow with heaven. Father, I ask that we would get to the place that is Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. And Father, I think one of the ways he does it is through the body here in the earth. And Father, let us flow with the prayers that we need to say. Father, let our hearts say we want you to arise because when you arise in judgment, we know that revival is going to fall, that healing is going to flow, that people's lives are forever going to be changed, and that you're going to get the harvest that you deserve. And Father, just change all of us. Change our, change our vision to line it up with yours, we ask. In Jesus' name. In the Shinar Directive, we journey down the Luciferian rabbit hole to discover the matrix of darkness that has engulfed our planet. In the Shirith Imperative, we dug deeper to unearth the power source of hell itself and how the body of Christ can labor to impede its functioning in the earth and lay the groundwork for revival. Now it is time to unveil the mysteries of both the priesthood of the kingdom of God and the priesthood of darkness. Until these mysteries are understood, God's remnant cannot realize their purpose or be released with heaven's power to overcome the agenda of the denizens of the second heaven. The Kingdom Priesthood is a training manual for the remnant to discover their priesthood, their purpose, and their service to Almighty God. In the pages of this remnant manual, you will discover what Adam experienced in the first few moments of life and how those desires were written into the DNA of humanity revelations of what the Almighty meant when he told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Who were the first priests of the kingdom of God in the Bible, and who was the first priest of darkness? What was the knowledge of the tree of good and evil offering the first family of humanity? How we all share the same calling as Abel. The reality of the Principalities Wars and how it is influencing the world today. Oh. 
as believers, how we are to function as both a priest and a tabernacle. The real purpose of the fire of God. How to carry the name of God in the earth with dignity and power. How the priesthood is essential for the releasing of end time warriors in the last days. How to flow in the sevenfold anointing of the Holy Spirit to represent Messiah. The kingdom priesthood is a call for the remnant to receive the fire of God and become the assembly that the gates of hell cannot overcome. Get your copy today at Amazon.com or KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.